Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here and to be giving this keynote talk. As you can see from my safari gear, I'm currently in Kenya on family holiday, but I really enjoy preparing this presentation and I'm excited to dive right in to talk about controlled environment agriculture over the next 40 years. So as I mentioned, we're gonna be envisioning controlled environment agriculture over the next 40 years. And my name is Henry Gordon Smith. You can connect with me on LinkedIn, you can email me, or you can follow my global travels on Instagram at the Agritect. For today's agenda, I'm gonna talk a little bit about who I am and what Agritecture is, which is the company I'm a CEO of. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what's happening in controlled environment agriculture today. So we sort of understand the context before we look towards the future. I'm gonna introduce the methodology as well as talk a little bit about controlled environment agriculture itself to make sure we have an even understanding. And then I'm gonna go into a scenario analysis for three horizons of the future. And actually scenario analysis will only be for a couple of them, but I'm gonna showcase scenario analysis for the longer ones. And at the end, I'll wrap up with some key takeaways for controlled environment agriculture in New Zealand. So it's a relatively dense talk today. I hope I can keep you entertained and interested. So sit tight and let's dive right in. So as I mentioned, I'm Henry Gordon Smith. I am a ag tech speaker. I've spoken on the topic of urban agriculture and controlled environment agriculture in five different continents. I'm a nomad. As of three years ago, I live out of a suitcase and I travel the world visiting farms, visiting clients, speaking at events, which is very, very exciting. I'm a dedicated consultant, which means I'm really passionate about helping solve problems. I work with clients all around the world, identifying their needs, helping them choose the right technology for their farms, or just helping them get the data they need to make strategic decisions in controlled environment agriculture and climate smart agriculture. And I'm a team leader. Uh, one of my best parts of my job is I get to manage a team of 15 global consultants around the world and different team members that work to make agriculture possible. I'm always, always grateful for them. So a little bit about agriculture. I started as a college student studying political science and I had this visiting professor that was an expert in environmental security. And as he taught us about water wars, I became really interested in this idea of resource scarcity and what was gonna be needed to solve that. So the challenge of climate change. And I started three different blogs and one of them was called Agritecture. And my intention was to explore the topic of high-tech agriculture balanced with community gardening, urban agriculture, regenerative agriculture, and sort of try to bring this discussion of localizing farming to our cities and making it more urban and high-tech in, in one place. And the blog got quite popular. People around the world were looking for for information on the topic. And so this became a digital location to find other people, to find opportunities, to find case studies to look at. Now, unexpectedly in 2014, I started getting a, a slew of consulting requests. And so it became clear there was a gap in the consulting services opportunity for the sector. You know, people that were contacting me for consulting didn't really trust the suppliers. They said, I just need data on yields. I need to understand my market. I need to sort of start from an earlier place. And so we developed a feasibility study methodology. I hired a bunch of smart people and we built the world's first uh, agritech, urban agritech consulting firm, Agritecture Consulting. And in 2020, we've decided to scale up our uh, impact as a result of COVID and some of the decline in services and, and for everyone being at home. And we built the world's first farm planning software, which is called Agritecture Designer. And I'll demonstrate that a little bit at the very end of this presentation. A little bit about our impact to date. Uh, we've crossed, I think, 250 consultations, 200 clients around the world in 40 countries. So again, very global. And as you can see from the range of services, we do a lot of planning services, developing your concept, uh, master planning work, farm design. We also work with investors to do due diligence for projects they're considering investing in. We help um, corporations and individuals do market research. So a range of services uh, to support the industry and to help it move forward. And again, mostly focused on planning new farms. So when you look around the world, we have a lot of experience of looking at the climate conditions, the social and economic conditions that might make a, a farm feasible or not. This is just a quick highlight of some of our impacts to date and some of our firsts. So I'm not gonna uh, read all of these, but I think some of the most exciting ones are, you know, Manhattan's first vertical farm. We worked with Farm One on that one. We've worked in a number of accelerators, including one with Kimball Musk and, and, and Tobias Peggs at Square Roots. And we also worked on a hardware accelerator. And of course our farm planning software is a really major first as well. 
And these are just a sample of the 200 plus clients that we've worked with around the world. Again, you can see there's a lot of corporate ones listed here, but there's also a lot of individual farms. And you can see that in our portfolio on our website. So enough about agritecture, let's get into the topic at hand. You know, I don't need to tell all of you about some of the major challenges that agriculture is facing around the world, climate change being the biggest, which really threatens the microclimates and typical ecosystems that support our agricultural uh, production. But also we have increases in greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, which is accelerating climate change, but also that increase of CO2 is declining yields in some products out there. We've got food safety issues as population demand increases and we're trying to produce so much and deliver it around the world. Productivity versus profitability is being threatened. Input costs are changing, regulations, et cetera. We have a lot of issues with transportation of food, food miles and, and waste in that food system, which also increases carbon. We've got a lot of volatility in the global context from wars to pandemics to economic uncertainty. Overall, agriculture is depleting a, a huge amount of our resources, including water and arable land. So these are aspects of agriculture, just a, a small list of, of the major issues with agriculture that we need to start working on. So introduction to controlled environment agriculture, right? That's the solution to this, <laughs> not to be too naive, but that's what a lot of people are saying, right? Is, is that to solve these problems, we need to grow indoors. And controlled environment agriculture is as it sounds, we're trying to control the environment around the plants to improve and accelerate their growth and to reduce uh, certain amounts of inputs. So we can see here on the left, we've got greenhouses, which you're probably very familiar with, and vertical farms, which are now getting very popular. So I assume you're familiar with those two. And I'll talk a little bit about the two differences, uh, the differences between the two. First of all, uh, controlled environment agriculture tends to have these advantages, which I won't read them all, but it's really about consistency, right? And that's where the word control comes in. You, you want to create a consistent product, no matter what's happening outside of the facility, whether pests, uh, various issues. So you, you do that by creating structures and various technological impacts around water and energy and light to be able to control the plants to maximize their output. But the biggest value proposition that's really popular now is year-round production. A lot of agriculture is seasonal, so the benefits of growing year-round include having staff year-round, which is better job employment, uh, better relationships with retailers and customers, stronger ability to get uh, stronger pricing, especially in the seasons where demand for your product is higher. So it's, it's really got a lot of benefits in that sense. And overall, in the context of a changing climate, there's a huge argument around resilience, resilience to storms, resilience to shocks in the system. And these are some of the benefits uh, that are being claimed and touted by controlled environment agriculture and are, are realistic. Now, as we control the facilities, we can also increase yields and reduce water use, which are some of the, the major, major benefits, in addition to consumer-focused benefits like uh, consistency and, and no need for pesticides. Now, because these farms don't require arable land, they can also be co-located uh, near distribution centers or close to urban areas. So there's many, many benefits as outlined here. But there are differences between greenhouses and vertical farms. Now, greenhouses, while they're controlled environments, they have less control. So greenhouses tend to have a lower capex because they use natural light. They may supplement with artificial light, but they at least use some natural light. They've got a lot more flexibility on the interior because they're single layer. Um, and they tend to have a lower capex, as is mentioned here, as well as a lower, lower opex. Some of the dis disadvantages are that they have a single layer of production. Uh, if there's fluctuating summers or winters, they are gonna have a higher capex. So that consistency in the product comes at a cost. Uh, a pretty significant one, because in the winter time, you have to heat that greenhouse a lot more, or in the summer, you have to cool it very, very significantly. Looking at vertical farms, this is where you go towards maximum control. And in, in vertical farms, the advantages are a higher density of production because we stack layers of cultivation. There's a lot more control and focus on what's happening throughout the farm. Uh, you can eventually get to a lot more labor efficiency in these facilities. And you can have ultra local production because they're so much smaller, they take up lower, less footprint. So you can co-locate them closer to areas where there's more consumption. Disadvantages are they have dramatically higher capex, not just because you're multiplying layers, but also because you're replacing every single layer of sunlight with artificial lights, which has a very, very high capex. But also each of those layers have microclimates as the plants are, are evapotranspirating, which means you need to have a high opex as well to cool it in addition to the capex of the climate control systems. And there's also a lot of heat created from these farms. Now, overall, one of the biggest downsides of vertical farming is that today 
if most of them are powered by non-renewable sources, so they have a larger carbon footprint. In some cases, a carbon footprint five to 15 times that of a greenhouse supplying the same customers. Now, there's many different kinds of controlled environment agriculture. You typically see lettuce or tomatoes, but there's some really interesting options. Gotham Greens first started with rooftops. Lufa Farms is doing that as well and continues to do that. Infarm sort of did small retail units, which they pioneered. App Harvest is an example of sort of economic development, a region that has never had greenhouses, can build large ones, create a lot of jobs, although their stock is definitely struggling. NGS is really cool. Uh, this is one of Agriculture's partners, and this is a farm in Spain that I visited in January, and it's actually an olive farm that converted 8,000 meters into greenhouse to grow dragon fruit. So again, thinking about CEA as a way to meet market demands for new and popular products, that's a good example there. Smallhold, which the CEO of Smallhold is one of Agritecture's first employees, Andrew Carter, he's done an amazing job building Smallhold, which is uh, has vertical farming to the sense that they're vertically stacked units indoors and they're growing mushrooms. And mushrooms tend to have a higher yield per square meter and have a lot of benefits as long as you can convince consumers to buy the product. Oshi is an example of a really premium vertical farm. So they do high-end strawberries, I think $5 a strawberry uh, in New Jersey, supplying the New York City area, a uh, rare, rare breed of strawberry from Japan. You can see here that cannabis is often used for CEA. That should be a no unknown, but this is sort of a hybrid system that Hypar is using where they use artificial light plus natural light in an in indoor system. Container farms are pretty popular. Let us grow is one of those uh, and one of our partners. You could say that aquaculture is also, um, recirculating land-based aquaculture is also controlled environment agriculture, and even insect production could be considered this. And there's others like algae production, et cetera. But this is just to show you that there is quite a bit of a range of crops and possibilities even today without looking into the future. I get to visit the world, uh, around the world visiting farms, as I mentioned. So these are just two I wanted to highlight. That one's a greenhouse, one's a vertical farm. Little Leaf Farms is pretty incredible. It's a, an automated greenhouse. So these are mobile gully systems. And actually what you can't see is that below that is actually seedling production under LED lights. So is it a greenhouse? Is it a vertical farm? But this is a really interesting system. So the seedlings go under and then when they're ready, they come up and they move along a system. And then when they're ready to harvest, they go on a tray out to harvesting. Every single step is pretty much automated even through into cutting and packing. So this is the largest uh, greenhouse, I believe, in the Northeast, and also they supply the most. So this is this is a successful controlled environment agriculture facility, which there's not necessarily that many that are successful, but this is one to look at if you're looking for a case study and how it can work. Bustanica is the world's largest vertical farm, and I got to visit that as well at the end of last year. And this is an interesting one. It's uh, located on the new airport in Dubai. It's partially funded by Emirates and Emirates Catering manages it. Now Emirates provides 250,000 meals a day through the airport in Dubai. So they said, let's build a vertical farm to reduce our food safety issues. So very specific use case. And that's what they've done. There's This is one of 26 rooms. What's interesting about this one is it's a little bit less on automation than you would expect for a 30, $40 million facility. And that's because the staffing costs are lower in the UAE and also Emirates uh, knows how to manage that staff and trade them. So they were less worried about the staffing issues and they really just wanted to build a, an affordable high-tech farm. And that's what they've done. The quality of the product is very good. You know, obviously they're not only going to supply airplanes and, and flights, but they're also supplying the local market. But Dubai is a relatively small market. It's very interesting to see how this new farm um, hits the market and, and if it's going to saturate it and how that market will respond. And there's a lot of farms being planned in Dubai. So I'm watching that market very carefully. Okay, now the sector is uh, very exciting. A lot of investment, a lot of interest. Uh, I've really certainly enjoyed being in it and seeing its growth over the past 12 years, but there's been a lot of problems. So this is just from Q4 of 2022. We did an analysis of issues across companies. And so we're starting to see this decline um, in, in the performance of a lot of these farms, including some of the ones that I mentioned. So you can read these. Uh, also, there's an article about it, which I, I sort of talk about later on. But this basically shows that the rise in energy in, in Europe, plus some various aspects of supply chain issues delaying projects, have really affected these businesses, which have very high capex and very high burn rates. But this is not anything old. In fact, in anything new, rather. This is something old. In fact, since I've been tracking these issues, there really have been a lot of failures with some consistent problems. Often it's going too big. Often it's over-engineering. 
Often it's not understanding your market. So there's a lot of best practices and lessons we can learn from the past that haven't been implemented yet, which is one of the most disappointing things for me as a consultant and someone who tries to drive the industry forward is there's so much naivety when it comes to vertical farming and even all aspects of urban agriculture that people rush in and they get really hyped up. They raise a bunch of money and they repeat same mistakes of the past. So definitely look through these if you're considering planning a CEA facility, especially a vertical farm, which is extra high CapEx and do some analysis of your own. Now, you know, I've been asked to sort of predict the future in this talk, which is a pretty big ask. And maybe it's because I did that already in December of 2021, when I took the Gartner hype cycle, which you see here, and I applied it to uh, CEA. Now, when I published this article at AgFunder and this quote here from me, um, I put the dot higher that we're sort of are at the peak of inflated expectations is about to go down. So uh, maybe a little bit over it. And that was because App Harvest and Aero Farms both had experienced some significant financial issues, which signaled a decline. And basically investors rush in when there's excitement and the companies and startups use the Silicon Valley approach to say, we're a unicorn, we're amazing, we're, we're the future of food. Everybody rushes in. And then when performance isn't as expected, we start to go into a very dramatic decline and investors run away. But then we move into a slope of enlightenment after the trough disillusionment, and then eventually into a plateau of productivity. What does that mean? That means commercially viable, productive, responsible, honest vertical farming and CEA companies that are significantly impacting the food system, which is, which is all our aspirations in the end here. So I highly recommend you read this article. It was the most popular article that year in AgFunder, and I think highlights a lot of what comes next and some of the excitement that I have about the next chapters for CEA. Okay, so let's go into the methodology here. So now we're going to start to look towards the future, okay? So there's three horizons we're going to look at, and let me just tell you about the methodology that I came up with for this. So horizon one is going to be the next one to two years, okay? So this is probably the most predictable. For this, I'm going to look at our internal data, my experience, and just some observations. So this is just the current state of CEA globally, uh, relatively high level because we have a lot to cover, and looking at the next one to two years. Now, Horizon 2, we're going to use a scenario analysis methodology, which I'll introduce, and we're going to look at the next two to 10 years of CEA. And then Horizon 3, we're going to take a much bigger look at the future and look at the next 10 to 40 years. We're going to keep that one a little lighter because it's less predictable, and we're going to build off Horizon 2 and talk about aspects of energy, water, population growth, and climate change and make some predictions there. Okay, are you ready? Horizon 1, let's go. So first of all, I think for the coming year and year or two, as there's been a decline in some of the investment and some bubble bursting, as uh, some articles have claimed in Europe because of energy prices and in the US because of inflated expectations with a lot of CA companies, we're gonna see the Middle East and North Africa and also Southeast Asia be a big part of the focus. But clearly the GCC and the Middle East, right? So the GCC is these countries the Gulf co co cooperation uh, on the Arabian Peninsula. But you also see across the Middle East, North Africa, there's a huge need. And what's that need? Well, one of them is increasing fertilizer costs that have affected farmers in this region in particular, but also around the world. Uh, again, CEA general uses a lot less fertilizer. Uh, also no pesticides can be used in some cases. And then of course, water. So water is, is the most big massive issue for this region. These are the most water scarce regions in the world, and yet they have rising populations. So there's gonna be a need for controlled environment agriculture to supplement that, and there's a lot of incentives and thus growth there. In the GCC in particular, there'll be growth as these countries try to diversify from hydrocarbons, and they actually have the liquidity at an individual and, bus and business and government level to fund the high capex of CEA. So huge opportunities for suppliers, consultants, even farm operators that want to run farms in this region in the coming years. Of course, very difficult because the heat is still a major issue. We're also going to see globally there's going to be a paradoxical um, investment and economics circumstance for CEA. What I mean by that is you're going to see the vertical farming market sort of grow in some places, Middle East, Southeast Asia, even parts of Europe and US are going to have new announcements of funding rounds, uh, new announcements of larger scale facilities. So it's going to say, oh, wow, this is growing, this is happening. But at the same time, you're going to see the bubble start to burst more and more. Um, energy costs are still hurting a lot of these businesses. You can see here, this is sort of a comparison of a greenhouse versus a vertical farm and energy based on a survey. 
Uh, but overall, I think that there's just a lot of hype that's been burst around vertical farming in particular, and a lot of the, ver the funding has gone to vertical farms. So you're going to see uh, simultaneously you're going to see growth from some CA companies, investments, and regions, and you're going to see also declines. It's going to be very confusing to say, is it up? Is it down? Is it up? Is it down? And I think this is what we're going to look at over the next one to two years before it becomes clear where this is all going. Food security being at the top of mind of individuals, but more importantly, governments, is going to be a huge driver for this. We saw since COVID and even before that, food security announcements, policies, incentives, uh, ag tech free zones that are being developed, accelerators, all of this is pushing more and more ag tech to the forefront. And, and that is going to increase not only investment, but also interest from various business people, individuals who want to make an impact on the world who have maybe uh, made some money from previous businesses. And of course, social entrepreneurs that wanna do something meaningful, just like I did many, many years ago. Uh, so we are gonna see this is gonna continue to be uh, driving the sector forward and food security will remain top of mind, top of discussion, at least over the next two years, certainly. And we are going to also see some things start. I think this is gonna take longer than one to two years. We're already starting to see signals of this. But basically, as the bubble bursts around vertical farming as the most hyped up type of CEA, we start to see people are going to adapt. So we've seen things like greenhouse companies invest with or merge with vertical farming companies when before they would be kind of opposed, oh, my tech is better than your tech. We're also seeing agrivoltaics, which is not exactly CEA, but it is about control, right? We're trying to create shade for the plants. We're trying to use the plants to cool the, the, the solar panels. In some cases, we bring in animals, but that is starting to respond to the environment around us and try to control that. So we're going to see agrivoltaics also increase, and I consider that hybridization. We're also seeing things like vertical farms uh, supplying outdoor farms. We, we see now vertical farms growing seed potatoes. We see vertical farms growing young uh, seedlings for forestry projects. So this idea that you know it's vertical farming, greenhouses here, soil based over here is starting to mix. And, and there's also a, a chapter in a book uh, called Menu B uh, about the hybridization of controlled environment agriculture that I wrote with my colleague, Brakely Bryant, which, which should be published in the near future. So that was horizon one, next one to two years. So I think, again, what we're going to see is, is growth. We're going to see excitement. We're going to see regions that are going to expand. And we're going to see uh, several companies struggle uh, as they can't perform, especially those that have already raised money, as they can't perform and deliver on what they promised to investors. Because today, uh, there really is not, for example, a vertical farm at scale that's profitable uh, consistently. That, that doesn't seem to exist yet. Uh, maybe in Japan, uh, there's a couple of them, but globally, it's it's really, really a tiny fraction. So it's just not proven yet. And in that uncertainty, there's going to be a lot of you know ups and downs over the next few years. But again, great opportunities to get started and learn from the past. And I would say also great opportunities in these emerging markets like uh, the Middle East, GCC in particular, and also Southeast Asia. And I have mentioned Southeast Asia a couple of times. The reason that's going to have such growth is because, again, there's a lot of issues around food safety. There's increasing populations in many of the markets that want higher quality product. And, and in Southeast Asia, they eat more leafy greens, which are grown in CEA relatively easily uh, than the rest of the world. OK, horizon two, let's go. For this one, we need to introduce our scenario analysis methodology, which is a methodology that we use on consulting projects and in workshops to think about the future. So instead of just guessing, we try to practice a methodology. And this is a methodology that's been adapted to agriculture's needs, but also is used for planning transportation systems or thinking about conflicts. Uh, it's used for many, many different things. And actually, you can use this methodology uh, as you wish. So a scenario analysis is a strategic plan, which is built out to generate future trends, for businesses, it's used to, to for building visions and making calculated internal decisions. That's the purpose of it. So, you know, that's what we typically use it for is for investor clients or for clients that are doing master planning projects. So we make the right choices. That's where we typically use it on our consulting practice. So these are the steps that we're going to go through. And so the first one is really about, well, I'm not going to read all of them, but these are the steps we're going to go through because you're going to see them repeated as we go through it. So again, it's about really like refining the question we're asking. Um, and starting to identify various stakeholders and drivers and turning points and starting to then think about, okay, what do we imagine that scenario looking like? So it's just sort of refining a prediction. The step one is choosing a question to be answered. So we are sort of asking the question, how will CEA look 10 years from now? Our, our horizon two is two to 10 years. And then step two is to identify relevant stakeholders. Now this is gonna help us understand 
who could influence this um, and, and, and what are some of the drivers that could, could influence this. So in this work with my amazing sidekick, Nico, um, we started to look at various stakeholders across policy. You can see investors, institutions, and we get into the specifics. And, and these are various stakeholders that could influence, you know, it, it make is CEA going to move forward? Is it not? For example, investors putting money into it will increase interest in CEA. Investors pulling money out will decrease it. Uh, the kinds of investors will also change the kinds of farms and the kinds of scales. We're seeing CEA start to be considered infrastructure, which isn't one of the investors we mentioned, but infrastructure investors are looking at this, or ESG investors are looking at this in meaningful ways. Okay, and we can also see researchers, farmers, I mean, so many different stakeholders that could influence, uh, make or break the future of controlled environment agriculture around the world. So step three is starting to think about plausible turning points. These are things that might happen that could change the future, could change the course of history and, and the course of history for uh, CEA. So we use the steep method, which means we look at turning points across social, technological, economic, environmental, and political landscapes, and we try to map those. So when we looked at social, when we looked at these steep uh, areas, you can see what we looked at. We looked at aspects of inequality that could drive things forward or downward. Urbanization certainly would probably increase the need for CEA because you know as we consume more for food in cities, we transport food longer distances in many cases, demand is centralized. So there's also a, a, a case to, to co-locate some production near these urban areas of consumption. Economic aspects, you know, if, if, if people can't afford a premium product, CEA, which tends to be more premium today, may decline. Entrepreneurship, if there's a great entrepreneurship culture, you might see new innovations develop. I think you get the idea, but environmental and political are also very important. Uh, climate change shocks, storms will start to push more farming indoors, uh, pollution levels in food, food safety issues, those could really drive CEA and accelerate it forward. And we've seen some of these already happen in the past 10 years. Um, we saw COVID accelerated this. You know, we see the war in Ukraine continues to uh, accelerate this. So there's, there's a lot of different aspects. Again, government can, can create subsidies in, in certain markets, economic development incentives that will push CEA forward. So all of these drivers, again, could be turning points um, that could suddenly take the direction of this and make it faster or slower. And, and again, the question is, will CEA, what will CEA look like in 10 years? How much of it will it, will, will it be? Will it be prolific? Will it be something that impacts food security in a meaningful way or not? So now we need to look at Uncertainty. So what we've done is we've taken essentially a lot of those turning points and mapped them on predictable to unpredictable, unimportant to important. So there's a lot of information here, and, and I don't want to get into it in too much detail, but you can see I put things like food safety and supply issues as quite predictable and relatively important. I put things like vertical farming reaches the bottom of the trough of disillusionment on that plan as a minus, meaning that it's going to drive less interest in the sector. But I think it's also very predictable and important that it will happen um, in this uh, horizon to look. Urbanization will continue. That's quite predictable and important. Um, we see additional environmental costs of agriculture. You get the idea. Now, energy becomes cheaper. We did a lot of analysis on that. There's a bit of a debate on it, but we still think it's quite quite likely that we're seeing that energy will become more renewable and cheaper in this next decade of time. Okay, we can see some other things that are pretty crazy here, like World War II, right? Very unpredictable, but very, very, World War, World War III, rather, very unpredictable, but very important. Gene editing for controlled environment agriculture, which has already begun, would be very important, but right now isn't really predictable on when it's going to happen. Okay, so step five is we're going to assess and reduce these. So basically, when you do this extensively, you're going to rate the relevancy to the goal, relevancy to time frame, stakeholders, et cetera. And, and you could go very to depth, like scenario analysis can take a month if, if you want to go really deep. So we're just doing it very quickly here today. So I just sort of shortened it and you just take that top uh, right, upper right box and, uh, you know, food safety and supply issues worldwide, I think are very predictable and uh, quite relatively important to CEA and will increase it. Cost of climate change and open field agriculture will become more frequent and costly, and energy will become cheaper. These are some of the most important things that I thought were relevant to the future of CA over these next period of time. So we sort of can map different scenarios. What you typically do is three different scenarios, and you compare them and define them. We're going very quickly here. So scenario one is vertical farming becomes more profitable, meaning it becomes sort of proven, and then people replicate it. 
Scenario two, energy becomes renewable and cheap, which I think is a very, very important one, probably the most important factor here. And the scenario three, also very likely, is unexpected shocks increasing the value of resilient agriculture, which will drive more farming indoors, will push more innovation to grow indoors. So now we map out the scenario uh, and look at it. So what I decided to do this time, and this is not the typical way, but I said to take the uh, Gardner hype cycle and make some headlines and predictions. So we've got here 2023 vertical farming declines into the trough disillusionment. Um, and so it's going deeper into it, which is today, what I'm predicting. 2025, several of the largest vertical farming companies, the ones that are the unicorns or been funded the most, I predict they will go out of business, which will help us enter the bottom of the trough of disillusionment. But now we're going to start to see a shift. Climate change is going to cause more crop losses around 2027, and it's going to push us to really consider how we grow much more effectively. By 2029, for example, berries, which is a, a diversification of CEA, could start to become commercial and be a part of high-tech CEA production. In 2031, energy could become dramatically cheaper, which could make uh, vertical farming, for example, a lot more economically viable and thus more replicable in different markets and ideally more renewable and sustainable. And then 2023, 2033, vertical farming and localized CEA is being recognized worldwide as being both profitable and sustainable when powered by renewable methods and a method of crop production that is considered around the world. And so it's gonna accelerate a new wave of investment policy and business support as we reach the plateau of productivity. So I believe this journey, my prediction is this journey will occur over the next 10 years and that's horizon two. And you can go into research needs further to refine these. This was very high level. These are some of the questions you would look at to refine these. But again, this could be thrown off. Horizon 2 could be completely thrown off. In this article, Nico and I write about the two biggest enemies of indoor farming, which are hype and uh, sustainability uh, through energy, rather. Hype and energy crisis. So the, these two things could shift, right? We can't really predict where the energy will go. And we also don't know that companies are going to start being more responsible once we go through the trough of disillusionment. We've seen with Silicon Valley that they continue to pursue a lot of greedy and hyped up activities. And, and we're not seeing investors necessarily stop doing that. FTX, Theranos, the list goes on. Step nine is results and recommendations. So we're still on horizon two here. So this is sort of what I would recommend to get to these ideal scenarios. One is smart energy subsidies. So there is energy in the system that's wasted. There's places that have excess energy. We should co-locate uh, vertical farms and greenhouses there to produce food off essentially free and cheap energy. These farms can be operated at different times of the day. This should be done ASAP by governments around the world with excess energy in their markets. Two, accelerate CA entrepreneurship. The entrepreneurs are really a big part of the lifeblood of this sector. They innovate, they go to the market, they test the products. They're super passionate about that. We need more of that, more accelerators, more support for, excel for entrepreneurs to integrate into cities and around cities. Uh, develop responsible urban agriculture policies. So I've made extensive lists of recommendations for cities across the world and have worked with New York, Paris, Auckland, uh, Qatar on different kinds of urban agriculture policies. But basically what it comes down to is you need to create pathways uh, for entrepreneurs. You need to make the city a bit of an incubator to develop these models. You need to allow zoning for agriculture. You need to bring developers to the table and you need to focus on equity, not just growing premium products, which means a range of urban agriculture, not just high-tech vertical farming. Four, you need to empower existing farmers to embrace CEA. We, we're not gonna replace agriculture with CEA, certainly not overnight. It's gonna take a long, long time. So what we need to do is we need to help them understand CEA and empower them to be a part of it. Five, we need to punish bad actors that are overhyping themselves and greenwashing. We need to hold people to account for the claims that they are making and ensure that they are not leading us to pathway of dishonesty or just damage, right? These are wasted equipment, wasted embodied energy, lost jobs, and the failures of these farms, although failures of normal part of entrepreneurship, when they're based on just hype and, and greenwashing is a complete waste of time and can damage the sector for the coming years. Okay, let's look at our crystal ball. Let's go to horizon three here. This one's a little bit shorter because it's a little bit less clear on, on, on how to look so far at the future. So I skipped ahead and I sort of said, you know, these are the things that I think are going to matter in the future, right? So food prices skyrocketing, extreme water scarcity is very likely and predicted in this period of time. 
uh, World War III may uh, happen in this period of time. We're going to see insects, algae, seaweed become a part of our protein mix as we need to uh, feed many, many people. Um, we're going to see that urban areas are going to continue to grow in growth and, and crop damage is going to continue. So this time I'm skipping ahead and I'm doing just very high level sort of uh, what, what could happen over the next, um, again, we're looking at 2033 uh, to 2063. I think I got that right. Yeah. So 2033, uh, climate change worsens and causes widespread droughts, floods. I mean, basically what's going on now is, is going to continue. Uh, but countries are going to get more insular. They're going to want to protect their own food system. We're already seeing that happen. So that means that they're going to want to produce more locally. And in many countries, based on our climate, based on their resources, based on the need for technology to empower people, CEA is going to enter as a, a success, successful way to do that. Population will continue to grow until 2050. So in 2043, we're going to see a lot of population growth, a lot of pressure across the systems. And CEA in the low tech form will also be a popular way to provide some sustenance. Now, again, CEA is about controlled environments, but it doesn't have to be as high tech as a vertical farm. It can be lower tech as well. And I don't talk too much about that in this, but I want to emphasize that I think hybridization and low tech CEA, especially around 2043, you're going to see a lot more variety, even places like Africa here where I am, you're going to see more CEA of low tech solutions grow South America and parts of Asia as well. In 2053, population will start to decrease uh, globally, which is a good news for us if we can hang on that, that long, but also bad news for capitalism. Um, and it's going to devastate, you know, we're going to have basically climate change issues and pest outbreaks are going to increase. So food prices are going to really be unstable. There's going to be a lot of difficulty with supplies, a lot of difficulty with employment. And so water scarcity is going to be, of course, one of the major, major issues. So essentially more and more drivers for CEA as we look over the next 30 years. 2063, let's look to the future, the dream of fully autonomous vertical farms. I don't necessarily think they're going to look like these Dixon de Pommier vertical farm skyscrapers, but you will probably see some of those by 2063. But essentially, fully autonomous vertical farms that you can buy as turnkey solutions that are profitable as long as there's renewable energy and, and affordable energy will be able to be bought around the world. And there'll be varying levels. You could get semi-automation or low-tech, as I said, but even these high-tech ones are going to be available. The, the variety of the crops in these systems, when energy gets cheaper, which it's predicted to get by then, is going to be a huge variety. Uh, you could even make the argument that the grains could be possible in some of these places because grain uh, supply will decline as more CO2 goes into the environment. So even those crops that it's hard to imagine they're going to make sense may make sense in the next 40 years, which could be really interesting. Um, but overall, CA is going to be quite prolific uh, as a way to, to grow food close to consumers. And we'll have a much wider variety of food and will be way more automated in most cases, although there will also be low-tech solutions. So very quickly as we wrap up, let's get into some takeaways for New Zealand. You know, New Zealand is an interesting place. You know, you might think, why would I need controlled environment agriculture at all? For me, looking at New Zealand, I think one of the most interesting things is that there's not as much flat land as certain other countries. And most of the flat land, based on the analysis I did, is, is around Auckland. And Auckland is just growing and growing and growing. And so, like many cities in the world, we're taking this arable land and we're just turning it into suburban developments. And so even things like leafy green production, which tends to require that flat land, you know, we're going to start to have to put it into greenhouses and vertical farms. So I think that there is going to be more CEA happening in New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand also today has, has great brand for food, but also a great brand for agriculture technology. So, you know, you could even look at CEA as an innovation play for this future of the next 40 years where this market is going to grow globally. New Zealand would be wise to invest in different kinds of CEA technologies, research programs, advancements in robotics, advancements in sensors, uh, to be able to gain a huge part of this inevitable future where CEA will grow more. So again, there's there's a range of CEA types that could be possible in New Zealand. Again, I don't think this will be the biggest market, but we are going to see it increase quite a bit there. So you may have some questions as you go through this and you think about different types of controlled environment agriculture. Where do I start? What's the initial cost? How big should it be, et cetera? And that's what agritecture does. So here's a quick uh, plug and some steps that you can take to understand this in, in detail and even predict the future a little bit if you want to play with the numbers. So agriculture designer is what I mentioned at the beginning. It's the world's first farm planning software. And it basically is a suite of farm modeling tools, including crop pricing. You've got commercial classes to learn the best practices. 
and you've got a supplier network where you can get the best prices and request your quotes. This is what the online classes look like. So you'll hear from me, you'll hear from some of my colleagues, and these are the topics we cover across technology, crops, and business models. So it's a really great way to kick off your knowledge if you're considering planning a vertical farm or, or, or a CEA facility or an urban farm even, because we educate a lot about uh, those methods and, and those business, business types as well. So when we look at New Zealand, it's actually really interesting. Uh, my colleague did some analysis and we sort of see some of the prices based on our uh, high level research. This is the data we used to model out what we would grow and, and what the input costs would be, which is what you need to do to do your own data, your own research, and then you plug it into the software. And so we chose a vertical farm in New Zealand, a very large one at 10,000 square meters in size. So again, in the software, you can choose vertical farm, greenhouse, or container farm. We then selected to do kale 50% and spinach. Again, based on these two products, we researched from the market. We put those prices in. We put the we override overrode the input prices around water costs, electricity, and labor. And this is what we got. So quite an expensive facility at $34 million uh, and change. <laughs> but we could see that a farm like this, based on these crop pricing, actually has a payback that's relatively healthy at 5.56 years. This probably assumes a, a, a sophisticated grower, which will reduce the wastage and the performance, which is one of the aspects of the software that you can control. But it's really quite powerful. You get reports like this, and then you can manipulate it and adapt it to your needs. You could do multiple reports like this, and you can compare them. So this is the fastest, cheapest way to get light feasibility studies for any greenhouse or vertical farm in the world. And then, as I mentioned, when you're done, you can contact our network of partners around the world to request quotes. And we're constantly adding new partners. And we guarantee to give you better pricing and faster quoting, which is a win-win for you and the supplier as well. And it works. I'm so proud to say, as I wrap up this presentation, that I was in Saudi Arabia, visiting Saudi Arabia's largest vertical farm, Batr Farms, 2,500 square meters of bed space. And the, the entrepreneur here, Khalid Shoker, used our software to learn the best practices, model out multiple types of farms, then contacted us. We recommended suppliers. And then again, he chose one of the suppliers and built the farm. So very, very excited just to meet him and his family and see that this is the world's first farm uh, planned online that was built. So very, very excited about that and, and sort of ushering in a new era of, of, of much cheaper ways to get the data and plan these facilities around the world. I want to thank you so much. This was a really exciting presentation to prepare. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you agree with me or disagree with me, I don't mind. I love the questions. If you scan this, you can connect with me and check us out. But again, you can see my contact information at the beginning. But really, really, thank you so much. And I look forward to answering your questions live. For now, enjoy the rest of the event and take care and talk soon.